recording. Please make a hybrid between oatmeal cookie and confetti. I think it means confetti cake. Oh, silly Ariel. No, 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 no. The computer knew what I was talking about. I was talking about these. Italian confetti. Known to the French as trages, and for us Americans, we know them as Jordan almonds. But unlike our teeth-breaking Jordan almonds, Italian confetti have a thinner, crisper sugar coating. Okay, so technically these are French, but they're the most affordable on Amazon in terms of absolute cost, and they have a similar sugar coating thickness as Italian confetti, so I think the switch is justifiable, though Italians may disagree. Confetti date back to ancient Rome, where much like today, they were used to celebrate momentous occasions like weddings and births. At Italian weddings, confetti are served in multiples of five to symbolize the five good wishes for newlyweds, health, prosperity, happiness, fertility, and longevity. So I won't be making my own reference confetti since I'm very doubtful that I could ever achieve this quality of a shell given my budget and time constraints. So it makes much more sense for me to evaluate a manufactured confetti. The shell is smooth, has a matte finish, and it's crisp and relatively thin although it still takes some effort to break through. You first taste the sugar, then the almond. I don't know if this makes sense, but it smells like Easter to me. It has this marshmallowy aroma to it, and you can definitely pick up hints of vanilla, which may be from the flavorings they add. The heat from my hand seems to be melting some of the sugar off the shell. The almond doesn't appear to be toasted, and the candy is sweet, but there's a slight tanniny bitterness from the almond skin. So you may be thinking to yourself, What's there to evaluate? It's an almond that's covered in sugar. And you're not wrong to think that, but behind this seemingly simple confection, there's actually a lot of food science, a lot of engineering, and a lot of time invested. So how do they surround an almond with a thin, crisp layer of sugar? By using this machine called a panner. So what's essentially happening here is that the operator fills the panner with centers. These are the things that you want to enrobe in a sugar shell. The operator turns the machine on, which causes this large drum to rotate, causing the centers inside the drum to tumble. The operator then adds a charge of sugar syrup to the pan, and because the centers are tumbling against each other and against the sides of the pan, the idea is that each center eventually gets an even coating of syrup. The operator allows the syrup to dry and crystallize on the centers, then repeats this cycle of wetting and drying until they've achieved the desired sugar shell thickness. So obviously this is an oversimplification of the process, because there are a lot of variables to consider. For example, the size and shape of the drum, the speed of rotation, the drying temperatures, and the composition and concentration of the sugar syrup, just to name a few. Some actually call sugar panning an art form because of the large number of parameters that influence the panning process. So it's really something to think about the next time you encounter these at a wedding. Science. It's good. But before we dive too deeply into the world of sugar panning, let's talk about oatmeal cookies. Early European colonists brought oatmeal to North America, but it wasn't popularized until 1877 when the Quaker Mill Company developed the flattened or rolled oat. The first recorded oatmeal cookie recipe was published in the US by Fanny Merritt Farmer in her 1896 cookbook, The Boston Cooking School Cookbook. And this recipe did not contain raisins. For my reference cookies, I'll be using a recipe developed by America's Test Kitchen, and here are the ingredients we need for these cookies. I'm personally a huge fan of oatmeal raisin cookies, but I'll be excluding raisins from my reference bake. You're welcome, Tom. This recipe is pretty simple, no stand mixer required or even recommended. You start off by whisking together all-purpose flour, salt, and baking soda, and in a separate bowl, you bloom cinnamon in browned butter. Then whisk in brown sugar, granulated sugar, oil, eggs, and vanilla. You then add your flour mixture to the liquid ingredients, fully incorporate the flour, then incorporate the oats. The recipe tells you to portion out the dough into 20 cookies, each about three tablespoons, or use a number 24 cookie scoop. I made a half batch, so I was expecting 10 cookies. And since I didn't have a number 24 scoop, I portioned out three tablespoons for each cookie using my 1.5 tablespoon disher. And I quickly became puzzled when I realized I only had enough dough for 6.5 cookies. Where? are my other 3.5 cookies. What? Okay, let's think about this. I left out the quarter cup raisins, but that only accounts for 1.33 cookies. 
leaving 2.17 unaccounted for, which is way too much lost batter to blame on losing it to bowls and spatulas. I proudly did not fixate on this issue and decided to weigh out all the dough I had, then divide the dough evenly into seven cookies. I spaced them out on a parchment-lined baking sheet and smashed them down into 2.5-inch discs, then popped them in a 375-degree oven for nine minutes. While those were baking off, I revisited the case of the missing cookies. After rereading the recipe carefully, I noticed that they do provide a warning about the omission of raisins, but even more striking of a detail is this line, about three tablespoons. So I looked up the capacity of a number 24 cookie scoop and found out that it's actually only 2.625 tablespoons. So there we go. This means that there's 1.24 missing cookies, which seems more reasonable of a yield loss. Once the cookies finished baking and cooled slightly, I transferred them to a cooling rack to cool completely before taste testing them. These cookies are so good. Brown sugar and cinnamon are always a winning combination, and the cinnamon isn't overpowering, even though I accidentally forgot to half the amount of cinnamon. The brown butter complements the molasses-y flavor of the cookie, the cookies are chewy and their centers are gooey, and the chew from the oats reinforces the chewiness of the cookie. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing cookie. So to make a confetti oatmeal cookie hybrid, clearly I'm going to need to sugar pan the hybrid. So the biggest hurdle with this assignment will be recreating a panning mechanism. There are panners made for the home candy maker, but these are hundreds of dollars, so that's pretty much out of the question. I could do it the old school way of rolling the centers back and forth in a hot sugar syrup in a pan that I hold over a stove, but I think we can do better than that. So here, Tom has drilled a hole in the center of this mixing bowl, attached a screw and bolt, allowing us to use this drill as a rotation motor. <gasps> so weird. To trigger the drill and hold it at a constant rotation, we've tied a rope around the trigger, and the hex key wrench gives us more control over the pressure we apply to the trigger. We hold the trigger mechanism in place using Gorilla Tape. Panning one batch of centers takes hours and even days, so I'm fully prepared for this drill to break. I'll be running the drill at a very slow rotation, but to keep the drill from potentially overheating, I'm using this fan to remove heat buildup. The panner isn't perfect and it takes some finessing, but I actually think this may work. To test our panner, I tossed in some almonds that I had dipped in 300 degree Fahrenheit sugar, and we learned three things from this. Number one, with the angle, size of the panner, and rotation speed, I won't be able to achieve something like this. I'll have to work in smaller batches. Number two, not surprisingly, the rounder the center, the better. And lastly, number three, candy made from sugar heated to 300 degrees Fahrenheit doesn't really have much depth to it. It just it just tastes sweet. So here are my ideas for the hybrid. I'm going to surround a toasted almond with edible raw oatmeal cookie dough. I'm then going to build a shell of sugar around the cookie dough using the panner Tom and I built. I'm converting ATK's oatmeal cookie dough recipe into a dough that's safe and pleasant to consume when raw by doing the following. Eliminating the baking soda from the recipe. We don't need a leavening agent since we're not baking the dough. Replacing both the granulated sugar and dark sugar with light brown sugar. Granulated sugar when not completely dissolved, imparts a grittiness to raw cookie dough, and that's something I want to avoid. If you're ever running low on light brown sugar, you can make your own by processing one tablespoon of molasses with one cup of granulated sugar. This is actually how commercial brown sugar is made. Replacing the eggs with some other liquid, I'll be using evaporated milk. Replacing the vegetable oil with butter and coconut oil, because I want the balls of cookie dough to maintain their shape at room temperature. I encased each toasted almond with 10 grams of cookie dough, and the next question to tackle is how to enrobe these dough balls in a sugar shell. In order to successfully pan a center, the center has to be robust enough to withstand the forces of tumbling without breaking apart. So there's no way I can just pan a ball of raw cookie dough since raw dough has little to no structural integrity. To circumvent this problem, I'm going to freeze each ball then dip the frozen balls in a mixture of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to the caramel stage, specifically 345 degrees Fahrenheit. To maintain their spherical shape after dipping the balls in caramel, I'll immediately quench them in cold water and dust them in heat-treated flour to remove excess moisture. In the world of sugar panning, what I'm doing here is referred to as pre-coating or gumming the centers. This is an important step when panning a center that has a lipid surface since it's difficult for a water-based sugar syrup to adhere onto a fatty surface, 
remember that water and fats don't mix. The pre-coat material helps the sugar adhere onto the fatty surface of the center. Historically, candy manufacturers pre-coat nuts with a gum arabic and wheat flour mixture, and the gumming step is done inside the panner. Now that I have the centers prepared, it's time to pan them. And here's a list of what we need. A panner, pre-coated centers, I can comfortably fit seven in this panner, a super saturated sugar solution, I'm using a 65% sucrose solution and holding it at 170 degrees Fahrenheit using my immersion circulator. And we need a heat source. After we add a charge of syrup to the centers, we need a heat source to promote water evaporation, which expedites sugar crystallization on the centers. We also need a spoon to transfer charges of syrup to the centers. We don't want our supply of sugar syrup to crystallize, so I'm placing the spoon in a water bath to eliminate possible sources of sugar seeding. I placed my pre-coated centers in the panner, turned it on, and added a charge of sugar syrup. I started off with one teaspoon of syrup, and even with this small volume of syrup, the centers clumped, so I was forced to add one teaspoon of powdered sugar. I repeated this wet charge, dry charge cycle two more times, and after the fourth charge of syrup, I no longer needed to add powdered sugar to keep the centers from clumping. Okay, so let me walk you through the whole setup and procedure so you can recreate this at home if you want to. I turn the panner on. Place my pre-coated centers into the drum, carefully take my syrup out of the hot water bath, take my spoon out of its water bath, add a one teaspoon charge of sugar syrup, return both the spoon and syrup to their respective water baths. When the centers get an even coating of syrup, add a one teaspoon dry charge of powdered sugar. Don't wait too long to add this. Let the centers tumble a bit in the powdered sugar, then blow hot air onto the centers to promote crystallization. Be prepared for powdered sugar to get everywhere. I actually needed to put on a mask midway because of all the sugar in the air. After two minutes of heating, repeat this process another two times. And for the remaining 16 cycles, exclude the powdered sugar and simply apply one teaspoon of sugar syrup, then blast the centers with heat for two minutes before repeating. After the 19th layer, add some granulated sugar to the panner, which acts as an abrasive to polish the shell. Let it run for about 10 minutes. After the whole panning process, I stored the panned hybrids in an airtight container with silica packets. And on the day of taste testing, I removed the container from the fridge and allowed everything to come to room temperature, leaving the lid closed to avoid condensation forming on the surface of the panned hybrids. I'm actually really proud of these and I'm really surprised it actually worked. These oatmeal cookie confetti are amazing! Like, not only for the novelty, but for the flavor and texture. I'm super happy with how they turned out. When you bite into the hybrid, you get a crunch from the pan sugar shell and the caramel coating. You then hit the soft, cinnamony, raw oatmeal cookie dough, then the crunchy, well-toasted almond. The oats are texturally distinct from the raw cookie dough, adding a slight chew to the layer. Both the caramel coating and pan sugar coating add something to the hybrid. The caramel coating adds buttery and floral notes to the hybrid that prevents the hybrid from being monotonously sweet. And the pan sugar coating evokes the same eastery feeling that I mentioned earlier when evaluating the confetti. It almost adds a creamy flavor to the hybrid. When comparing the panned versus unpanned versions of the hybrid, you can definitely tell there's a difference. Tom and I both prefer the pan versions. I do have two notes for future iterations. First note, it's a little too sweet, but I think I can solve this by replacing one sugar charge with one salt solution charge. And second note, the hybrid would benefit from having a polish or glaze applied to the outside to prevent the sugar shell from absorbing moisture from the air and softening. I think these may be my favorite hybrid that I've made so far. Um, and I'll definitely be making them again. I think they'd make great party favors. If you'd like to attempt this hybrid, you can find the first draft of the recipe following the link in the description. So I'm having a lot of fun making these hybrid videos and I'm hoping that with enough subscribers, I can make hybrid bakes a sustainable project. Um, so if you enjoyed the video or learned something new, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing this video. All right, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.